recipients of this year's Representative Paul Lukey Legislative Championship on Mental Health Award are Senator Tamara Banger and Senator Tommy Tucker, and I'd like to ask them to come join me on the stage. <laughs> Senator Tucker and uh, Senator Banger are being recognized today for several years' worth of work in the legislature on important mental health issues, uh, including last year's successes with Ryland's Law, a law that will overhaul uh, our foster care system uh, and make sure that we set a standard for foster care being provided across 100 counties in a way that has high quality of service, consistent service no matter where a child lives, transparent way of doing business, and a reliable delivery mechanism for support. One thing that I would personally like to recognize both Senator Tucker and Senator Banner for is that they are both very good at taking quiet issues and making them loud. <laughs> we know, we know, we know that for too many reasons, Mental health does not get discussed loudly enough in this society. Foster children are too often ignored. There are too many people that we care about in our lives or that we care for in our service whose voices are simply not heard, whose challenges are not recognized by people who have the most power to do good things for them. And it takes people like Senator Banger and Senator Tucker who are willing to do very hard, very gritty work in the legislature to take an issue that most people are all too comfortable avoiding and make enough noise about it that they can get major legislation done. I'm very proud to serve with them and would really like to congratulate them on the awards. They are being given uh, these beautiful state of North Carolina plaques made by Josh's Hope. Congratulations to the Representative Meyer, what a wonderful, what wonderful things you said about us. Um, I'd like to take a minute to tell you a little bit about myself. I know some of you in the room and some of you know me, but um, uh, I have an awful lot of passion for, for these issues, and I'd like for you to understand why. I'm from a very modest background. Uh, my first home didn't have indoor plumbing. My dad lost everything, or our family lost everything, in an uninsured tobacco barn fire in 1960 when I was two years old. And the wonderful thing about it is I grew up pretty much in poverty for the first five years of my life, and I didn't even realize it until just a couple of years ago. <laughs> and what a blessing. And I thought about it. Why? How could that happen? How could I, from this very modest background, end up getting to be a professor at a world-class university, I get to serve in the North Carolina Senate. And there are many factors, but the big one was a strong, loving, healthy family. That, that defines me and defines everything that I do. I make a difference. My husband, Brand, is here today. He's going to go, he'll be leaving in a little bit because our daughter's prom is tonight and he's going to be the chef for the breakfast. So he's got to go to the grocery store. But when we had the opportunity to serve, we became therapeutic foster parents with the Methodist Home for Children for 10 years. And boy, did that open our hearts and open our eyes. We had children in our home that had been brutalized. One child had been strapped in a car seat, locked in a dark closet, and I can only imagine her screams while the people that were supposed to love her the most were right outside the door ignoring her. We also had a child in our home that had been lifelighted to Chapel Hill, so brutalized uh, with multiple broken bones, they thought she had been shaken, and thankfully she had not, but at not even three months old, she had also been uh, uh, sexually abused, and I think the worst thing of all, besides the cracked skull and all the, all the, the, the physical harm, um, was that she did not want people to touch her. She did not want, she was the easiest baby to put down because she didn't want to be cuddled at night because to her, human contact did not have the meaning that it should have had. We had others in our home. We had a very large and still do circle of friends who were foster parents. 
And one of the things that I discovered in this, this situation was I don't think there was a single family that did not either have a mental illness issue or a substance use um, disability, or frankly, it was usually both. And so when I had the opportunity to come to the General Assembly, my husband and I agreed that we would take this on. It's a whole family thing. And I do not, I do not sleep at night because I'm haunted by those visions of those children. And I get up early because I'm haunted by those visions of those children. But when I got to the General Assembly, I was just this one girl senator uh, with a big old smile and a whole lot of really ambitious ideas. And little did I know that I was going to meet Senator Tommy Tucker. <laughs> We are the most unlikely pair, I would think. Although, as we got to know each other, there's really a lot more in common there than we know. I want you to know that every piece of legislation that I took to his office, and let me tell you, they were considered, I think, probably harebrained schemes. I wanted to, to extend foster care to 21. I might as well have had three heads when I started talking about that. This whole business of restructuring the Department of Health and Human Services, not just for foster children, but for the aged and the elderly and the vulnerable and those with mental health uh, and substance use issues across the state, that set people's hair on fire. Let me tell you that every time I would go to his office and ask for his help, he did not hesitate. He would, I would hand the bill across the table and he put his name on it. And then he and I together would begin fighting, fighting for that. And I'd often at night, when I was having those nights that I couldn't sleep, I would imagine, because this man has had my back, he's had my back for six years. And that phrase comes from medieval times when people actually fought with swords and you fought back to back so that you didn't have a vulnerable place. You were covered, you were covered. And this man has been covered for me. He's also taught me to be louder. I think what uh, Representative uh, Meyer said was so true. I can remember when I was championing the PRTF education issue for children. You know, before that, in this state, if you were in Duke University Hospital or if you were in Chapel Hill or Wake Med or wherever it was, a, a teacher would be sent to you, but if you were at a psychiatric re uh, residential treatment facility, those children did not have educational opportunities. They do now, and one of the reasons they do now is this man standing behind me. And the reason for that is I was one day, I got in a dust up out in the hall with someone who was trying to tell me that a PRTF was a private school and we should not be educating those children. Yes, it is laughable. It's ridiculous. Well, he... I'm, I'm, of course, not having any of that in a full dust up. And he happens to walk by, and I see him in the corner of my eye, and I'm thinking, oh, here comes the cavalry. Senator Tucker's going to come in. And, well, he just kept walking. <laughs> <laughs> and it took my breath. And for a minute, I lost my train of thought. And then I realized, as he said so many other times, but he said it with his actions and not his words. He, said, he was saying, Baringer, You've got this. You've got this, Baringer. <laughs> and sure enough, we did. I, I cannot say enough. He's the most humble man. He would never let me tell him these things. So I wanted to share it with you. I want you to know just how great it is. He has announced his retirement. And now he thinks that I'm not going to be plopping in his office and sitting down. And, and he's going to say, all right, Baringer, what is it this time? But I've got him on speed dial. <laughs> And so I know, and there have been times when we were making all that noise, he would say things like, Baringer, there's blood and water. I know there's blood and water, but you know what? We've got this. We've got this. You've got this. Well, Senator Tucker, when I call you up, you're going to have to say that again because I'm not going to give this up. You're not going to give this up. And we're going to keep doing this together and with all of y'all. So it's the greatest honor, and I'm so humbled and so gratified that you would recognize me in such a wonderful way. But I'll tell you the thing that means the most to me is to get to share an award, share this award with the man that has mentored me all these years. That's the real honor that I have. So thank you so much. And I now yield to the champion of the vulnerable, <laughs> Senator Tommy Tucker. I'm running for
for president. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, damn it. Bring tears to my eyes for all the hard work. Um, it is great to be here this morning. It is a tremendous having attended NC State. I can think of no other place I'd rather be on a Saturday morning than Chapel Hill. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, the Lord has worked on me. All my friends now, later in life, as bad as I hated Chapel Hill when I was a teenager in my early 20s, when Coach Smith was winning all the ball games and my high school sweetheart married a Carolina basketball player. <laughs> I got people to work with like a UNC law professor. <laughs> Let me tell you about her. She's a workhorse. She uh, puts all these bills together, the ABLE Act, Ryan's Law, foster care, but she's not only puts the words to paper, she takes the passion to paper as well, to make a difference and to make something happen for the less, least of these. And, and she is um, the champion for the children and champion for all the causes that she takes on. It's been my honor to be with her and to, I felt like I was playing football again because all the time she asked me to run interference for her. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's okay. We, we have, have certainly enjoyed it. You know, we are all human beings in the legislature, and we bring life's experiences to the legislature. I uh, cannot believe I'm standing here as a senator and in front of all you folks to speak this morning. I grew up in eastern North Carolina. My dad suffered from PTSD from World War II. He was an abusive alcoholic. Um, and so I grew up with the lights being turned out, the water being turned off, the gas being turned off, the uh, foreclosure on the house, the running out of the house at two in the morning when my mother and father were fighting and neighbors coming to pick us up to, to uh, have a place to stay. And I can tell you that the impact on children is, is unbelievable. I left that family environment um, very dysfunctional. Uh, with a big chip on my shoulder, for when the kiss it tells me Sundays is still there. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I grew up in that environment, and then um, with no uh, understanding, my mom had fought cancer. Uh, she died in November of 65, and then my father died three months later of cirrhosis of liver right in Durham at the VA hospital. And so there's my sister and I. Um, there we are left with nothing. Uh, my father didn't have any money, he'd spent it all. Uh, we didn't have a place to stay. The Methodist Church paid for me to go to military school in Virginia, so I left home when I was 15. But I'm a survivor. Um, and so that's what I bring when I talk to someone about mental health. I've had to deal with it myself. I've had to go to counseling myself. Um, I was a big time drinker in college. It cost me a college education and a party guy. And right on up until the Lord got a hold of me when I was 30 years old and turned me around. So um, I tell you, that when we get involved in this, she's lived it and I've lived it. I have someone in my immediate family in 1980 who went to Morganton to a state hospital with mental health. And that back then, uh, it was 1 800 Good Luck Raleigh because you couldn't get a response about mental health. That's changed today. That's changed today through the efforts of Dr. Cohen and Dave Richards and their staff and all the great employees of the LME MCOs. Um, I can't tell you how our phone has stopped ringing because of the work you do and the people you serve. Um, it's, a, it's a daunting task. But we must continue with 25 million people with opioid crisis and the dysfunction that reaches out and touches all those families and the problems that prevail. Um, folks in this room and the people you serve and your consumers that take upon your uh, services uh, are, are key to our society making a turn. It's a great honor to be honored with the Paul Lutke Award. I served with him a brief time before he passed away. Um, I served with Tamara, and I served with those folks in DHHS. And let me say, folks, while things seem dim, DHHS is a heck of a lot better than when I got there in 2011. I can tell you that. 
Dr. Cohen and I share a great relationship, even though she's a good uh, blueprint. Uh, <laughs> no, she has the respect of the legislature. She, I've been through four health directors, and she is the most knowledgeable out of the four that we've had there. Um, and, you know, my tact is a little bit blustery sometimes. And uh, the first time I met her, I fired at her, and she came right back at me. And then I was laughing about it, and a guy told me, said, well, you think you're going to catch her off guard? She uh, testified before Congress when she was eight months old, like eight months <laughs> pregnant, and uh, made that congressman look like toast. So <laughs> you're not going to bother her. Dave Richards, when we birthed the LBMCOs, I told him I'd never bring it up again, but he was head of the ARC, and he thought I was crazy. But I can tell you the LBMCOs will be around, and we'll talk about that later. But I am so very grateful for all of you professionals who serve the least of these. It must be a mission. It must be a heartfelt passion. And it's critical to this nation that you continue. Thank you very much.